Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, Oscar in Dallas tried to help a business owner remove a demonic entity from its premises only to have the demon follow him home. That story and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. That it is, 855-853-4802 is our phone number. Of course, you can also write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. If you like the show, help support it. Keep us on the air, become an extra podcast person. EPP at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash realghoststories. $5 a month is all that is, and it gets you access to all of our bonus episodes. We have brand new ones we put out for you every single week. You get advanced episodes of our show, archived episodes of our show, our ebook, our audio book, and a whole lot more. It's all right there for you to binge away on five bucks a month. That's like I said, that's what supports this thing and keeps our pirate ship afloat. I know times are tough for everybody right now. We greatly appreciate all of our EPPs who help keep this show going. Uh, it is the uh, weekday episode of the show, but uh, my co-host today is not Jen. It is not Carol. It is Harper. Hi. Hi. So, yeah, we've uh, we got kind of a craziness going on in our household right now. Uh, no one has COVID, so that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is one of us is uh, in the hospital. Nobody here on the show right now, but... Uh, it is not Jen. Uh, Livy um, is uh, in there as of the recording of this uh, in uh, mid to November. Uh, so when you hear this, she's probably out by now, uh, God willing. Uh, but uh, it's a nasty, nasty stomach flu that uh, we all got in this house. And she got hit the worst. I swear it's probably the worst stomach flu of my life. Um I'm back to a functioning uh, sense, but it's still, you know, I won't go into detail, but the uh, the aftermath still uh, is happening. Uh, you had it not you probably had it the least of all of us, but you had it. Yeah, I, I think I still have it because my stomach still hurts. Yeah, you still got that going on. But uh, Jen uh, has had it. Uh, but uh, Livy actually ended up in the children's hospital for. We're going on the third night tonight, I believe, um, of her there and a lot of trying to do pain management and get her back to hydration and health and all of that. And it's just been a rough, scary ride. Um, the first thing, obviously, that goes through your mind is, you know, COVID and all that. But they did all the tests and everything. And that is it's not what it is. But obviously, other things do exist in this world besides uh, COVID. Uh, which is what I think a lot of people miss when people are stressing, wear a freaking mask. And, and I'm saying that without swearing and saying a lot of horrible things that I'd love to say about people who don't wear masks right now because my child is in the room. But the biggest reason is we don't want to fill up all the hospital beds with 100% COVID patients because then when someone has a stomach flu or something else, you're out of hospital beds. And if you have a heart attack or anything like that, sorry, no rooms in the inn. So that's why it's just so crazy. It really made us think about that, too. I mean, we've been following protocol 100 percent, but it puts it more into perspective when you're like right on the front line of all of it. So even though it wasn't COVID, thank God, wear your freaking masks. And um, anything you'd like to say about that? Wear your masks so more people don't end up in the hospital. I think she put it well. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to let it all out. And, you yeah. sure do. 855-853-4802 <laughs> is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Uh, let's go to that uh, first story that we have uh, here today. Uh starts hey man it's me oscar mendoza from dallas with another ghost story 
This story just happened a couple of months ago. It all started when a random fan of my Netflix appearance tracked me down to help her with a demonic entity hurting her staff at her bar in Dallas. I get many people reaching out to me about their paranormal experiences through social media, either through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I decided to help this particular business owner because the evil presence kept hurting her staff. This type of help is hazardous because demonic entities can hurt my family or me, so I had to ready myself. I consulted my aunt Nico, a witch, on how to cleanse a building or something evil. She taught me a ritual that would help me. Later, I informed the owner I would be helping her, but I didn't get to guarantee anything and volunteer to help her. The owner was an older woman of Hispanic heritage. Her bartender accompanied her. She was a young blonde in her late 20s. They both looked scared, not the simple afraid, but the type of fear that makes one's hands tremble each time they speak of it. That's what they called a demonic entity. She asked me why I didn't charge people, and I replied, I want to help because you asked me to, and I care. I brought my daughter with me because her friend from high school, families owned the bar, and she was into the paranormal. I strongly disagreed, but they came nevertheless. Straight away, my daughter felt something evil and old. I also felt the entity, and it was hiding in their back room. The owner had recently bought the building next to the restaurant in hopes of expanding her business. I asked the owner not to tell me anything about her structures nor her life. I looked at the back room and noticed a man with a top hat, a type people used in the 1800s. He had a gray face and black lips, white gloves, and a long trench coat. I turned to my daughter, and before I can say something, she said, I feel a man looking at us, and she points towards the closet. I asked the owner if there was another room beyond the back office, and she turned around surprised. I asked, and she said, yes, there's a hidden door they discovered to the warehouse she had just purchased. My daughter looks at me and tells me, he's there in the darkness, and he's waiting for you. I have to be honest, it freaked me out because of what I saw. I asked the owner to open the door so that I can confront this entity. I asked my daughter to stay behind because the warehouse was pitch black. It was already around 10 at night, so it was hazardous. The owner and a bartender volunteered to join me in the warehouse, and I was thankful because I was scared. The man I saw looked just like the Babadook from the movie, except this thing had white gloves with long fingers. It looked at me and it smiled, almost daring me to follow him. So yes, I was frightened. My daughter grabbed my hand and said, don't go. You don't have to do this. I turned to reply, if I don't, it will hurt more people and I can't let that happen. She lets my hand go and I'm the first to step in the cold darkness inside the warehouse, followed by the owner and the bartender. The warehouse has three sections and we walked into the first section. The area was dark, so I took out my phone and snapped some pictures and used a light from my phone to guide me through the first section. The first room felt heavy like a funeral home. I turned and told the owner it was a funeral home. Amazed, she said yes. The section we were in was the embalming room in the early 1900s, and she showed me the blood-drained area where they sorted the bodies. So we walked into the second section where the mortician office and other rooms were. I saw a large man move to the warehouse last area from the corner of my eye. I turned to the owner and said, he's over there. The tall man with a top hat on the third section. And she replied, how did I know what the old owner with the top hat? I replied, because he's looking at us. Right when I said that the bartender screamed something, scratched her arm and they both quickly left. I was alone in the warehouse. I noticed strange symbols on the wall and candles on the floor, and I recognized what the signs meant. I did my ritual to banish the evil entity using sea salt and other materials. I finished, and I sealed the secret passage to the warehouse with sea salt. I warned the owner not to open this door anymore and that this wasn't over. What I felt was pure evil. And what I did only pissed it off. that I would need to do something more powerful to banish this demonic entity. We all go home and my daughter stays with us that night because she says she feels the man in our house. I also feel the dark energy there too. It followed us home. In the morning, I got up to work. When I smelled something foul in the air, I walked towards my dining room and I noticed rice on the floor, but this rice was moving. To my horror, my dining room floor had maggots. I knew what I had to do. I performed the same ritual my aunt taught me and I blessed my house. I was sure the evil entity was gone from my home. That afternoon, the owner called me and said the warehouse caught fire and it turned turned down around 10 in the morning. That's the same time I did my ritual at my house. 
I don't believe in coincidences. This evil spirit burned down the warehouse as revenge. The owner also said that the fire marshal couldn't pinpoint where the fire started because there wasn't any working electricity or any combustible fuel in the warehouse. The odd thing is that the fire burned the warehouse and not her restaurant. Before I left, I blessed her restaurant, so I wonder if that's the reason it didn't burn down with the warehouse. I thought it was over, but it wasn't. My house started to get swarms of those big horse flies and more maggots. It was back and stronger than ever. It attached to me. Even my little dog ran away from me. My wife performed an egg cleansing on me. It's a ritual using an egg to remove any negative energy from someone. Once you finish, you break the egg into a cup of water, and if you have something evil, you should see it in the egg. Once my wife broke the egg, it had a single maggot in the yolk. The maggot freaked my family out. My daughter was concerned about me. She made me a holy charm from a red spring, dipped in holy water, and a St. Michael pendant. She placed it around my neck and said, only someone that loves you can bless you. That night I fell asleep, but in the middle of the night I felt a gagging sensation as if I felt someone or something come up to my throat like vomit. I quickly got up and gagged, and that's when I noticed a man standing next to my bed with his hand in my mouth. I promptly spit it up and spit the hand out. The man looked at me with his mad black eyes and lips and a wicked smile and top hat and screamed at me without saying a word. Just like that, it vanished into the darkness. My mouth tasted of ash and dead rot. So I got up and quickly brushed my teeth. I promptly thought, was that thing still inside me? Hell no. I slept with the lights on that night and that morning. I asked my daughter to make more holy necklaces for the restaurant staff. That day, we passed him the blessed charms to the staff of the restaurant. That night, I performed the final ritual at the bar, and it finally worked. So far, no more haunting at the restaurant or my warehouse. Now you know why I'm not particularly eager, eager to help people with their paranormal problems, but I'm a nice guy, so I still do. I'm finishing my third book, and we started filming a movie based on my life, so ask your listeners to visit my website, deadfollow.com, to stay up to date on the movie news and follow me on social media. Happy Halloween. Stay safe. Oscar Mendoza in Dallas. Oscar, of course, has been with our show since day one. Some of his stories uh, first debuted on our show. The story that really kind of propelled him to a lot of attention. The uh, zombie, uh, the zombie ghost clown story from way back got the attention of, uh, of Netflix uh, and the series Haunted. And uh, you can see that account. In fact, it all acted out. In fact, if, you, if you've watched Haunted, Quite often, the icon that appears on my television is the one from our show, <laughs> the uh, the zombie ghost clown, which is just kind of freaky to see when you're just trying to watch like reruns of Frasier. But uh, that's uh, that's what you get. Uh, so anyway, thank you, Oscar, so much. If that story sounds familiar, we did read it on our live video cast on Halloween on Facebook Live, but that's the only other place that story has been shared so far, and we wanted to share it here on the regular program as well. What's your thoughts? Well, um, having a man with long fingers, having his hand in your mouth yeah. as you're sleeping and you're gagging, and then you... You wake up and there's maggots in your dining room? Yeah. Hell no. Yeah, that would just be utterly terrifying and just horrific to have to deal with and feel that. I mean, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. If I felt it, I would bite down on it. My question would be, what is it like uh, <laughs> if you uh, are, no, not that, but what would you, I don't think I'd bite down and I'd be afraid it would like break <laughs> off in my mouth or something. What I would be uh, concerned with is if I was just your average employee at that restaurant, doesn't really have anything involved. You're just there to make the check and the tips and you're not like invested in the restaurant. It's, it's a job. It's just there for you, you know, and they show up the next day and they're asking everyone to wear, uh, holy, uh, charms and necklaces to keep the demons away. I, I don't know that I would stay at that job. Uh, I, I think I might be like, what? And I'm, I'm not saying that I would be thinking they're crazy or anything like that. I would just be like, this is some stuff I don't want to take home. This is not worth the tips I'm getting for pancakes. Uh, you know, it's just, 
Uh, you have to imagine there's probably a few people that maybe were like that. I don't know. I don't know if it was a family business or what, but that would be an interesting thing to have your boss come and say, hey, can you please wear this uh, this necklace? Because it's going to keep the demons away from us. Well, what I would do that came. What I would do is I would take the entire jar of tips, get the hell out of here, go home, spend the tips on that little doll. That's not how that works. It's not. You can't steal other people's tips and then buy LOL dolls. Someday you're going to listen back on this and you're going to be like, I was really, Dad, what did you do to try and get me to stop being into those LOL dolls? <laughs> and my answer will be everything, honey. I tried everything. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's uh, go over to a caller. Hi. Hi, Tony. My name is Samuel. I've been listening to your show for quite some time now. I'm a night shift worker, so I like to listen to it while I work, which is my AirPods on. Um, I did want to share a short story with you guys as well. So uh, when I was a kid, I was about eight years old. My parents purchased this large farmhouse way out in the middle of nowhere, and they actually happened to have known the owners prior. And the owners um, had lived there for like 40 years, and um, they actually ended up passing away and my parents acquired the house and uh, the house was built in the 1880s and it was this huge old farmhouse and it was on 12 acres of land there was a pond absolutely gorgeous in the middle of the country and um, we were all watching the super bowl my entire family and keep in mind we are a large catholic family um, so my parents don't believe in ghosts and i didn't until this experience we believe in familiar spirits such as demons but um, we're all sitting there watching the Super Bowl, and we were eating chili in the living room. And um, an apparition, a full-body apparition, it looked like a shadow man, walked in the living room, leaned against the doorway, looked at us, turned around, and left. And everybody in that room saw it. Even my parents say they saw it, which is a big deal, because my parents are the type of people that are like, don't give anything power, don't acknowledge it, so on and so forth. So then a couple months goes by and it's Thanksgiving and uh, we've got a whole bunch of family in town. My mom's a great cook. So typically everybody ends up at my mom's house for Thanksgiving. Um, some of my older sis, uh, siblings would come back into town and we're all sitting praying at the dining room table before we're about to eat. And we hear a baby cry upstairs coming from the second floor of this house. However, nobody had a baby at that time. There wasn't a baby in this house. So, uh, Probably about three years later, my dad is looking at adding an addition onto the house and doing some things to it. And he goes to the city and requests the original plans. And it takes him a couple of months to get it. But they do end up giving him some records um, from the 1800s and early 1900s. And um, in the 1800s, the original plan of the house was much larger. There was an entire different wing on it. Um, however, in the 1900s, it became a hospital, and then it became a children's home. Um, in the time that it was a children's home, it had a fire, um, and it essentially lost an entire wing of the house, and 13 children died in the house. Shortly after that, my parents sold the house and moved into a different, even more creepier one. And his phone cut out, but don't worry, he called back. So we have more of his story. Continue on. Hi, Tony. This is Samuel from Ohio again. I was just following up. I did get cut off the last voicemail. Um, so essentially what I'd left off with was my parents had ended up leaving that house and they had owned another house they had purchased. They were planning on fixing it up and reselling it. But after um, a couple paranormal experiences in the previous one, they decided just to move into the house themselves. So they move into this beautiful house and it's a Queen uh, and Victorian home and it had hardwood floors and giant great built um, building cabinets and woodwork that was all original it was a gorgeous house um, and uh, I had had a friend and his name was Curtis and uh, I was gonna go to Curtis's birthday party but my dad had to work kind of late so he couldn't pick me up so he said you know if Curtis's parents can bring you home then yeah you can go so you know they talked to Curtis's parents and they're like yeah no problem we'll drop him off so um, you know my birthday party's over and I'm getting ready to get in the car with Kurt and his parents and his parents asked me where I live and I told them the address and they're like whoa you live there and I was like yeah I do and um Kurt's dad said you know I lived there as a kid that place is haunted and I was like okay because like I had said I, I didn't believe in ghosts at this point um so he's telling us about how there is a secret passage on the third floor 
and that in the secret passage, you had to go into a closet and there was a built-in bookcase in this closet. And if you pulled out one of the pieces of wood, then you could push back um, and it was like a full little doorway. He was absolutely right. So if you pull off the middle bookcase thing, you can literally push the wood behind it, like the backing back, and you can pull out all the shelves and then it's a doorway. You can go into like a hallway. And there was a couple like unfinished rooms in there. Well, um, my sister ended up moving back in with us after college and she had lost her car keys and some things had ended up going missing. And we were talking about, you know, where they could be or all this stuff. and. I had said, well, you know, Kurt's parents said that this place is haunted and Kurt's dad lived here. So maybe they're in the walls um, in the secret passages. And everybody just kind of looked at me and they're like, what, the th- what did you just say? So I had said, maybe they're in the secret passage. And they're like, what secret passage? I was like, the one in my room. It's, it's in the closet. So my parents were like, what are you talking about? So everybody goes upstairs with me and I show them. And sure enough. My sister's car keys and a whole a whole pile of objects that had gone missing had ended up in there. And my parents are the type um, that they said, you know, you have a demon attached to you, Samuel. You need to you need to go to church. So then they end up contacting a priest. Um, I had to speak with the priest. I got prayed over the whole nine because my parents believe that there are demons attached to me. That's when the paranormal activity in that house got really, really, really bad. Um, so then it was like slamming doors and a whole bunch of stuff and I think the breaking point for me was when I turned about 17 years old and I had a friend come stay the night and he left at probably about two in the morning had his mom come pick him up because um, something kept stomping up and down the stairs to the third floor all night and um, he physically saw a shadow person I had seen it as well Um, and he looked at me and he said I'm sorry I can't stay here I'll never stay here again there's something really bad going on here So my friend goes and he leaves and he posts about it on Facebook. And that's when I was like, okay, you know, I don't want to live here anymore. And I talked to my parents about it. My parents were like, you're, you have demons on you. You're attracting demons. Like you're bringing them into the home, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, whatever. And I ended up moving out the next year. My parents still have very bad paranormal activity at that house, but they refuse to leave because my mom states that God gave her that house. Um, And she has just like lost herself restoring it. Um, but there's a lot of crazy stuff that's unexplainable that happened in the house. So a couple of years ago, my sister and I were looking up uh, the history on that house and come to find out it was the first hospital in that town. Um, and then it became a furniture store and then shortly after a funeral home. Um, and after presenting that like to my parents, they were like, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Just last week, my mom called me because my younger brother ended up moving into my old bedroom, which nobody had lived in at the time. It was on the third floor all by itself. And she said, you know, Asa is experiencing things. Um, What exactly did you experience? Because they had never really taken much of what I had said into fruition. And I told her and um, she said, okay, whatever, love you, hung up. And I was talking to my grandma um, about it and my dad's the really Catholic one. And I was talking to my grandma about it. And she was like, well, you know that we're sensitive to that type of stuff. And I said, what are you talking about, grandma? And she goes, yeah. She was like, my mom used to swear that she would get like premonitions and she would see things. And I've seen things too. And a little backstory, when I was five, my little brother actually had passed away um, in another house we lived in, which is why I moved out of that house and into the farmhouse. And um, my mother, my sister, and my grandmother all predicted how he was going to die. Uh, When he was, like, not when he was going to die, but, like, a general month of when he was going to die and where he was going to die. And um, they all had seen it in a dream prior to it happening. It was nothing that anybody could have prevented. Um, But that's how he ended up dying. So, you know, she was like, you know, you know that these people dreamt about that before that happened. And they also dreamt about this and that. And um, I was like, no, I, I didn't know that. So I talked to my mom about it. And she was like, yeah, that's true. You know, Sarah and I did have that dream. And so did your grandmother. And, you know, there are some people in our family who are sensitive to certain things. But my mom had said that it was because we were so good with God that we were being attacked by demons because we were destined to do good in the world. Um, like with God's work and that he was trying to, Satan was trying to prevent us from doing that good. Um, And 
I got contacted by a lady who claimed that she was a medium and that she had to warn us essentially because there was an entity that was attached to the home um, that was evil and it essentially wanted to do us harm and wanted us out of that house. Um, and I gave my parents the warning and it's just like, you know, they didn't really believe me or anything. And uh, I came to visit them one time and I had moved out. I was on my, I, I lived an hour north and I drove down and I got to the stop sign about a block from my house and I could smell smoke, which wasn't uncommon because I thought, you know, it was a fireplace burning out of a chimney, you know, it's like a chimney, something like that, because it was kind of colder. And I got around the corner and realized it was their house it was on fire. And um, a, ba- a fire had started in the basement. They still don't know how. Um, and they ended up leaving that house not too long after that, sat vacant for a while, and then they moved back in because my mom claims that, you know, God had given her that home. So they still live there to that day. Um, it is considered to be one of the more haunted houses in town, actually. And they didn't find that out until the first Halloween that they lived there when they were doing, like, the spirit walk. And they stopped at that house as one of their stops. Um, and... <laughs> Even then, my parents still didn't believe me or my siblings or their own eyes. They chalked it up to its demons, it's, you know, a negative entity um, that wasn't sun godly, so on and so forth. Um, what's kind of creepy about it all is about five months ago, about 500 yards from where my parents' house is, is like the town center, and there's this big gazebo there. They tore down the gazebo that had been there since like 1910 and started doing construction for a hotel and they had found um, a Native American burial ground that was there Um, and essentially they were all buried there. They originally thought that it was like a Native American burial ground that the natives had done but that was actually where the people who founded the town, which was Thomas Worthington, he and a whole bunch of other people rounded up the entire indigenous population, brought them to the town square and slaughtered them all and then buried them right there, just 500 yards from my parents' house. So, you know, they really don't see or deal with that type of stuff anymore. Not that I know of, they don't really talk to me about it, but that's a true experience that I did have in that house. And that house to this day gives me heebie-jeebies. I don't like to go there. Um, I've actually moved a thousand miles south because I just have no interest in even being in that city or state anymore. Nor do I blame you for not wanting to be around an environment like that. Yeah. Um, especially when there's this demon in your house, that's literally going to steal your sister's car keys and hide it in a secret passage. Uh, The, the thought of, of what happened on that, that plot of land or, or right in front of that plot of land, you know, and when we talk about historical terms, everything is fairly relative, meaning that whole general area likely had stuff going on and it wasn't necessarily, oh, it's in front of the house. Now right where the house is. That, you know, that shit went down right there on that house. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's disturbing and I don't blame you, especially if you're remotely sensitive to, to have something like that happen. And it's different than a battle. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, there's, we, we walk around the battlefield here in town and it's sad and, but we, we feel a lot of peace there. You know, it's, you know, it, I don't really get, I mean, obviously a lot of horrible things happen there, but um, a battle to me is very, very different than an overzealous, uh, population that took over someone's land that then decides to go and kill everybody who originally had the land, all the indigenous people, uh, that to me, that's evil. That is not a battle. That's not a fair fight. That's not a, a war. That is, th- that's slaughter. That is, you know, just utterly disgusting and, and horrible. Uh, and that in itself would I think create far more negative energy than uh, than like I said, like a battle or, or a, a murder or something like that with that much sadness. So I don't blame you for getting the hell out of there. 
Thank you for sharing that story with us. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. That's going to wrap up today's episode of the show. If you like the show, keep us on the air. Become an extra podcast person in EPP. Sign up at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories and help keep us on the air. Until next time, for Harper and all of us at Real Ghost Stories Online, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.